Hey, I'm Veronica from Uexpressure. Let me briefly introduce you to what we at Uexpressure do. Uexpressure is an online platform where you can build customer journey maps, impact maps and personas for your organization. With more than 100 ready-to-use templates, you can speed up your persona creation and mapping processes. To help you build confidence on your journey and learn from other practitioners, we host community events on user, customer, employee experience and all things journey mapping. Our speakers are industry experts that are willing to share their knowledge to help you design and build better products and services. We also speak at the events ourselves and share tips and tricks we learned through years of practice and numerous interviews with other mappers. On top of that, we have your Expression Academy where you can dive into learning how to build journey maps, personas and conduct interviews. And do that all at your own pace. Don't forget to check it out and enjoy the event. Welcome to How to Build Actionable Customer Journey Maps. I wrote this just for this event, so this is the premier adventure uh, for it. I'd love feedback if anybody thinks it needs some love. And for those of you not familiar with me, uh, thank you for the beautiful introduction. You can find me on YouTube as Delta CX. I have over 700 hours of video. If you add me on LinkedIn, please tell me you saw me here today so I know you're not a scammer or a weirdo. So please tell me you, you saw me here today. We also have a free Slack and Discord uh, communities. You can join them if you like. Note that uh, when I do these talks, I tend to say CX and UX interchangeably. Uh, to me, when they're done right, CX is UX, UX is CX, and, and I don't want to die on the hill of who's a customer, who's a user, who's a human, who's a dog, who's a primary customer, who's a secondary customer. So I'm just going to say customer, but it could be the end user. It could be anybody, So just to keep it short. Um, all right, let's jump into some slides. Um, so my starting point for this talk is about skills. Most people would probably say the skills you need to make a good customer journey map include having a good template, knowing how to use a journey mapping tool, dropping information into the template, and having a good idea who customers are and what they're probably doing. This makes it sound like anybody with a template and some good ideas can create a customer journey map. That might be true, but most people will create a poor journey map or the wrong journey map. And these aren't the true skills that go into customer journey mapping. We should have our eyes on the quality of the work being done and the outcomes it can produce. But sometimes we think it's more important to just get work done, even if it's not being done well. So we know there's a difference between good and bad customer journey maps. So we'll be talking more about that today. There's good and bad conversations with users and customers. There's good and bad screens. You can use Figma well and be a poor UX designer. So we must remember that the artifacts and even the tools are not the skills. Customer journey maps are artifacts or documents of qualitative research. While interviews can be effective, it's best to observe the journey. What people say and what people do might not be the same. Not everybody remembers or can describe every step they took and the details around each step. This means that the real skills for customer journey mapping are CX and UX qualitative research skills. And these skills include studies of human behavior and cognitive psychology, problem finding and solving, critical thinking, deductive reasoning and logic, putting your preferences and biases aside to design for user needs, and especially for research, planning the research, choosing the best methods, planning the correct questions and the tasks and journeys we should observe, choosing the right quantities and types of participants, executing sessions with neutrality and a good interviewing style, observing and noticing things others miss, being a good mini detective, um, analyzing the data, bringing it together to report on insights, pain points, and opportunities, and delivering actionable suggestions around these. Strategies and decisions are only as good as our customer intelligence, which is only as good as the research that we've done. And that research is only as good as all of these skills and how are we're applying best practices and good techniques. So anybody can create a customer journey map. Anybody can grab a template and drop real or imagined information in. 
The question will be, how are we making sure we're setting up our teams and projects up for success? Because we work from what we know. And when we don't know, we work from what we guess. That's where risk and waste creep in. And if for many of us on the, the adventure right now, 258 of us, it's probably partially or wholly our job to identify and mitigate our risks and save our team, teams from making costly mistakes, burning, idea, burning, bad t burning ideas. Oh, sorry, let's try that again. I need my... See, take that again, burning time on bad ideas. And that's ultimately the real value of this type of CX and UX work. We're helping our teams and company attract new customers, make them happy or happier, and retain them or improve that loyalty. And every company wants this. We provide the intelligence that will help make better decisions so we can achieve these. A customer journey map is just one document that helps us represent and share customer intelligence. So why do we create a customer journey map? Because we want to visualize how a target audience experiences something now. That's mostly it. Great customer journey maps help us make decisions, take action, prioritize, and understand our customers better. Great customer journey maps set us up for success when we attempt to streamline and optimize the task and experience and create a desired future state journey map. Bad customer journey maps might end up filed away, never to be seen again. Bad customer journey maps mislead us and make us believe our guesses and assumptions are true. Bad customer journey maps should be treated as a document that represents project and company risk, not as a document that is a source of truth. The customer journey map you see on the screen looks pretty good, right? It's thorough, organized, and it contains all of the elements we expect to see in a journey map. But what you can't tell from looking at it is that I created it as part of a job interview challenge. I was asked to create a customer journey map choosing whichever persona I'd like, taking whatever journey. So I grabbed a persona I made in 2014 when my company did a research project on how people with Parkinson's disease use fitness trackers, and I pretended that Community Carry is shopping for renter's insurance. The persona was real, but didn't come from an observational study on how people shop for renter's insurance. The journey is completely made up, and the persona is outdated and irrelevant, but it looks pretty good. And if we're not careful, our company might create strategies, directions, and products for this imagined customer and her guessed at and assumed journey. Today, we'll be looking at some customer journey maps and using our critical thinking to determine if they're good or not. But what are we looking for? We need clear criteria to help us understand if the journey map we're looking at or working on creating is good or not. First, is the journey map from the customer's perspective? Did we map their experience or did we map awareness to advocacy or some sort of funnel? Did we map how our internal teams or business units view our customers or did we map our customers realistically? If our journey map includes opportunities or suggestions, do these truly solve real customer problems or pain points? Or are we suggesting what might solve our business problems or treating the customer like some pawn we push around? Does our map show the journey correctly or did we map something too high level or lacking in detail? We'll look at an example later of a journey map that is too high level. Where did we get all the information we put in the map? Did this come from great qualitative and preferably observational research? Did it come from guesses, assumptions, and we know our users? You can guess at a, a customer journey map, but that's risky and wasteful. Make sure your journey map is marked clearly that it is assumptive. The best journey maps are made from watching our target audience live through their experiences in their natural environment. We know the map we're creating represents the real journey because we witnessed it 
over and over with multiple research study participants that were carefully recruited to best represent a particular target audience. Make sure you're evidence-based and data-informed. Guesses, assumptions, or hopes that end up in your map should be marked as risks and elements to be replaced with knowledge. If you're not starting with great qualitative research, a map highlighting guesses and assumptions should inspire us to invest in a research study so we gather customer intelligence to, that'll set us up for success. Does the customer journey map help us understand the user problem, pain point, task, or need? Do we understand the root causes of these problems and pain points? Sorry, can I ask someone to mute, please? Um, it will be harder to create the right strategies, decisions, or products if we don't really understand users' problems and everything causing them. Does our customer journey map make the mistake of offering so-called opportunities or solutions when we don't understand the real problems? Does our customer journey map provide customer intelligence so we can make better team product and service decisions? Did our map help us during a prioritization exercise? Did it help clarify what our team might need to work on first? Not which features do we build first, which pain points and problems do we address first? Does our journey map inspire our CX and UX designers? Can they review this map and start to understand how to solve customers' problems? It's great when a customer journey map is pretty or even beautiful, but it's more important that it be functional and actionable. While working on maps or reviewing an existing map, let's ask ourselves these questions and think critically about the answers. This might lead our teams to some tough but important conversations. How much information should be on a customer journey map? Should we include the amount of time spent on a step? How detailed should it be? What about variations that we saw across research participants? Not everybody will take this journey or move through the task identically. Should we include how people feel? If they don't mention how they happen to be feeling, can we really know? Are we guessing what they feel? Should the customer journey map only show successful journeys? Do these always have to end on a happy note with smiling faces and people dancing with their dogs? Can our journey map end in frustration or disaster? You should be including enough detail so that the journey map is true and accurate, helps us find pain points, write good problem statements, and see the opportunities for improvement or true innovation. Your customer journey map is not enough if it doesn't help our teams strategize, prioritize, and make better and more customer-centric decisions. Okay, get ready for our first exercise together with 278 people. Please go to menti.com 1941-1157. It's on the top of the screen. This is a journey map. These are just some journey maps I found searching Google Images. So I'm not picking on these companies for any reason other than they showed up in Google Image searches. So before I say what I see in this journey map, and you see I've got room for it here, Let's see your comments. What do you notice about this journey map that might be good or bad? Let's see, is, it, uh, is this working? Is the poll working? menti.com 1941. Okay, doesn't include feelings, which could be good or bad. We haven't decided yet. Few customer actions, quote from the user POV, assuming they're real quotes, maybe these were made up. It's broad, it doesn't tell me anything. It's visual, I'm reading some of the things that you're answering. Where are the emotions? Business point of view, where's the persona? Hey, there's no stereotypical picture, no clarity on sentiment, no friction points. What's the graph line? High level, very broad, simple, tone is defeatist, information too general, squiggly line. Customer, a lot of people saying it's lacking emotion. Someone said, blah, 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 blah. I agree with that as well. 
where are the problems? The journey doesn't end more positively than the beginning. Well, we don't know. No back of house touch points. Yeah, that might be a little bit more service designy, but still a great point. Um, shown as an NNG example, not realistic. Yeah, I think I have one from them later or, or some, all the, I got them all from Google. So they're all various, uh, you know, things. Is this aspirational or as is? We don't know. Opportunities are vague. There's no milestones, not humanizing. Wow, this is great. I know there's hundreds of you and the comments are, are super. Many people are saying too simple and not specific. It's high level and vague. What are the real pain points here? And again, for those of you who aren't seeing the screen, this is a persona from Jumping Jamie. Uh, Jamie needs to switch her cell phone plan. She wants a plan that can save her money without sacrificing user uh, usage limits. So we'll talk about it. Yeah, the bubble, the speech bubbles are who? Are they real quotes or or did we make these up? And how will a company prioritize based on it? Okay, great. So with 98 responses, I'm now going to show you what I see when I look at this customer journey. So I'm not looking at your responses right now. I'm going to go to mine, but thank you for all of the great answers. So let's start with, are we looking at the customer's perspective? Maybe. At least it's not first I became aware of company X, but does Jamie's life change if support answers calls faster? Was that a real problem? Knowledge sources, and is it true? We don't know the sources, but it doesn't seem true to me. Watches commercial is a hint. Is that really a step of the process or something marketing put in so we feel better about all that money we spent on commercials? Um, is this journey different if Jamie doesn't see our commercial? Do we really think that she will call her current cell phone carrier to tell them she's shopping around? How often does that happen? Does she call competitors to negotiate with each one in the 2020s? She doesn't just pick one and sign up from the website. She will make all those calls and then call again to sign up. If Jamie wonders if she can pay less, does she even check her current carrier's website or call them just to change to a cheaper plan? I'm sure only a percentage of customers end up switching to other carriers, especially if they're locked into a contract and switching means paying an early termination fee as it does in America. Where in this journey is figuring out if she has an early termination fee or not. Uh, does anybody, let's see, I think I have to load up a few more of these. Uh, does anybody stop and define the parameters they require for a new cell phone plan? Who puts this much work into it? The journey seems unrealistic. It seems like the company imagined this, but probably didn't observe people doing most of this. Is her expectation friendly and customer support? I think I've loaded up too many uh, arrows. Um, or is her expectation to not need support at all? What, what do you think? Is her expectation friendly and helpful support? Or I hope to not call support at all. And it looks like the same old happy, sad, happy customer journey map. We are frustrated all day long and we know companies suck, yet every customer journey map seems to end with success and happiness. Journey maps should map reality. Now let's talk about problem definition, even though I've loaded up too many arrows. What is Jamie's problem? Do we understand it? How do things go wrong for her? Why is this so difficult? Doesn't tell us what's difficult. Opportunities look like specific solutions. We don't really understand Jamie's problem, but we seem to know or imagine that comparing competitors' offers, breaking down her current plan, and offering customer support via text messaging or chat will solve the problems that she has. Prioritization and decisions will probably start with showing competitors offers, breaking down her current plan, and adding more customer support channels. But are those the right decisions? Top priorities? How will we stay on top of every competitor's offering to put that on our site? Could we be sued for misrepresenting other companies' offerings? Are we inspiring designers? Can CX and UX designers know what to create to help Jamie solve her problems? 
Probably not if we don't understand her problems. If I had to guess, I would say this was a customer journey map put together by a marketing team, and it's got a lot of guesses, but real business decisions will be made from this. I think our customers deserve better. All right, we're gonna do the next one. There's five of these. So get ready. This is a TSA checkpoint journey, and I found it in an article, so I'm going to read it out loud to you. You can read the screen or listen to me read and go back to Menti. You should see a new question asking, what do you think about this journey? Here's what it says. For example, imagine that you're designing a new experience of going through the TSA checkpoint at the airport. Your moments along the top of this user journey map might be... Pack for trip, travel to airport, arrive at airport, find security line, show ID to TSA, go through security, find gate, arrive at destination. Once you have your top level journey moments or touch points, use your personas to go step by step and capture what your user is feeling, thinking, and doing at every phase. Through this process, you can begin to map the breadth of problems your user faces to identify the most prominent issues to tackle through design or innovation. Okay, lax overview, not easy to read. Arrive at airport, when do I get on the plane? Yeah, I guess that, that's uh, some good questions. Journey phases are so much broader than the real experience of going through TSA. What is TSA? Transportation Security Administration. It's the security checkpoint in airports in America. Scope is too broad. Online check-in is missing. Doesn't this person have luggage? It's very high level. It assumes there aren't pain points getting to the airport, getting through security, and sometimes racist, sexist, transphobic people, the TSA. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, phases are different levels in terms of size and specificity. It's biased to your own perspective. You're not looking at customer information. Do you have TSA pre-check, which is something you can get in America so you can skip some of the security line? Your moments might not be customer moments. What about cues? I feel like the user might be nervous during security because they could have an item confiscated. There's no visuals. Yeah, there's no visuals because this was from an article telling you how great customer journey maps are. So this isn't the map itself. It was someone talking about it. Where is drinking the whole bottle of water before security to not throw it out? I was doing that recently in Milan's Linate airport and a security woman comes running over to me and tells me, you don't have to do that. Our new machines can take liquids. And it was like, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, go through security will mean take off your shoes, take off your jacket, unload your pockets, put your laptop in. Yeah, can I actually carry this? How many ounces? Yeah, wonderful answers. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to go back to uh, some of the notes I made, but super answers from the live uh, poll from many of you. So my first question is, does this sound like a customer's real journey going through airport security? Can you think of important steps or experiences this misses? Do you think this is the journey for a disabled person? How about someone who doesn't speak the language of the airport they're in? Does our customer understand the latest secure security policies and procedures? Did they pack ahead of time knowing those? Will they be surprised when they try to go through security? And most importantly, and I, I'm not sure anybody got this one, can you read a persona document and know what someone's journey was from reading a persona? Do we ever really know what our customers are thinking or feeling? And can you read a persona and know what someone was thinking or feeling in a different situation? I would say we only really know what people do or what they say. They might say they feel or think something, but it's still what they said, and we're not psychic. We must be careful of thinking that we know what someone feels or what they're thinking. Would this customer journey map pass our criteria? Will we understand problems in detail? Will we be able to make good decisions and take the right actions from it? Will designers know where to start? It doesn't sound like any research was done. It sounds like we're going to guess based on what we think people do because we have a persona. All right, number three out of five. Who's ready to keep going? So we've got Anna. 
Um, Anna is also going through airport security. This is a different customer journey map I found. What is good or bad about this customer journey map? Oh, too broad, no specifics. Looks like a template not filled out. It's half filled out. Yeah, I'm going to load up the bottom in a moment. Confusing. Visuals have to have context. Sounds like an ideal experience with no problems. Right. So, so true. There's no detail or information. Random numbers. Uh, there are visuals and photos, and that's helpful. Why isn't it in the first person? Skipping steps. Is Anna traveling with other people or alone? Doesn't feel realistic. Seems too linear. Too vague. No visit to duty free or restaurant? That's right. Anna is hungry and never goes to the toilet, right? Where do you, someone says, where do, where's the part where you go to the bathroom and miss your boarding call? Where's her frustrations? Where's our opportunities to improve? Who's Anna? There's no pain points. No bad things happen. Seems like an ideal experience. Doesn't seem to be actionable based on pain points. Lots of road, lack of roadblocks and interruptions. It's called an emotional journey, but no emotions. I'm going to load up the emotions in a moment. It was, a, I, I cut them out. Who's responsible for each stage? Hey, they're mixing needs, actions, and touch points into singular statements. Stock imagery isn't great. Yeah, I didn't make this, so you get to say whatever you want. Um, are we guessing what Anna is going through? What is she feeling? Uh, doesn't account for 99% of human experiences. Yeah, these are great. Um, let me load up the rest of the slide because there's a lot to talk about here, but thank you for these so far. So let me talk through what this seems to say. Anna arrives at the airport. She checks in. Whoa, is that really her next step? How did she find where to check in? And how did that go? Is she even in the right terminal? Then she checks out the gates. Does she have to? Gates are sometimes written on the boarding pass. I use an app that notifies me of my gate. I don't look at the gate boards that much. Anna may or may not check the gates. Anna goes through security. We already talked about how many steps that is. That should not just be one step on a journey map unless this is super high level and you're going to have multiple journey maps to, to go with it. Because it could be dozens of steps from the knowledge of what you can and can't take through to packing and unpacking, taking off certain items of clothing, moving around your electronics and batteries. So many steps just in what is one step here going through security. And I'll stop uh, with this, but you can see that a map like this is very high level. It would be unlikely to be actionable or provide the details that we really need to make decisions, understand the problem, or start considering the solution. And I'm a little nervous to see this up here. It's a spot for you to fill in what percentage of this map is assumption based. It's better to note how much of this is guessed or assumed than to not mention that. So yes, calling things an assumption based journey when it's not based on good qualitative research is, is what we should do. But why did we make a map from guesses and assumptions? It's important for us to then do research so that we replace assumptions with knowledge. But that raises critical thinking questions. What's the benefit of starting with a guessed at journey map? Are we basing decisions and strategies on incorrect information? And if we're going to guess at the map, do research, and then correct the map, did we waste time by starting with a guessed at map? Did guessing at the map limit our research and accidentally cause us to miss steps that our assumption based map left out? A journey mapping instructor who showed this map asked attendees to think about how each of these airport steps uh, went from their own recent experiences. We were told to drop a dot based on how positive or negative each step was for us. Here are the dots that people placed. This is reality. At many steps of a journey, people have very positive, slightly positive, slightly negative, very negative, and neutral experiences. Does our journey map capture that? Did we get all of that detail? Or did we go with our biases or stereotypes and say, checking in for the flight was great and Anne is happy. Going through security is awful. Anna is sad and mad. 
we could draw all of these dots to show which participant had what kind of experience or felt what kind of emotion. But does this help us? Is this good evidence? How can we act on this? Do we have enough detail in each step to understand what's going well and what's going wrong? The instructor said, journey maps aren't supposed to document all the possible steps and experiences, and if we want to map everything, we need flowcharts. Okay, we'll talk about that later. But if the customer journey map isn't the real customer journey, what are we documenting? What are we doing? How do we know what to include or exclude? Will we pick the wrong things because of biases or stereotypes? I'm very concerned about these things. Okay, we've got another one. Let's load it up. Paula, I found this one in Google Images, and, and it's clearly some sort of template, but let's roast it anyway. Go ahead, roast away. Tell me what is good or bad about Paula Persona. Because even though this is clearly some sort of template or example, I think we've all seen real customer journey maps that made a lot of the same mistakes that this sample makes. No defined persona. Super high level. I like turtles. Very vague. No idea what Paul is doing. No context. Yeah. What is journey phase one? And again, this was probably a template. So some of these things are vague, but I still noticed some real serious problems here that I wanted to talk about. Uh, who's she interacting with? What problem is Paula trying to solve? What do the phases mean? Super broad. Yeah, and again, it was a template, so I'm sure some of this was left out on purpose, but I think as a template, I'm not sure it's a good model that we should be following. Quotes based on what info? Heart icon for being concerned. Yeah, that was a little weird. Uh, Karen much? Yes. Uh, who is Paula? What's this supposed to tell me? Uh, no comment, but if there was a comment, there's nothing to comment. Okay, we have comedians in the audience today. We could map the journey of the comedians. Comedian tries a joke, comedian's joke doesn't go so well. <laughs> Sad comedian. Um, what does the irregular landscape line mean? Yeah, what do the gradients and colors mean? What's each journey phase? Inconsistent icons and, uh, uh, icons and journey dots. What are the actions that change her emotions? How do they know the opportunities are the right ones? I understand that this is a template, but there should be a brief explanation of what this persona is experiencing that justifies these reactions. Great. I love what you're all saying. So here's what I noticed. First, we seem to have no idea why this customer is this angry dealing with our company. What is the problem? How, when, why? Always, sometimes, I have no detail on this, which means I'm not sure where to start to fix this. But the map confidently says that we just need to incentivize support or sales reps more or better. Really? Does that fix the customer's problem? Our customers ready to leave us and we think our internal teams need better incentives? Suddenly and magically, this customer will be freaking thrilled with us. Everything's going great. No concerns anymore. All the past problems are forgotten. And our opportunities are to share best practices learned. That's it. No problems to solve here. It sounds like our company sucks in so many ways. Do we even know what best practices are? Holy cats, it looks like our customer is in hell again. They're annoyed because some other part of our company failed them. Wow, we really have a lot of problems in a lot of areas. Did we learn from sharing our best practices? Evidently not. And I don't know what we are smoking, but we imagine that our customer has multiple problems with multiple parts of our company and dreams of leaving us, but won't leave us? Really? They've considered it, but will be loyal despite the problems we cause them. And our opportunity here is to use digital tools. Which ones? How? How will digital tools solve various multi-dimensional problems customers have with us? It's obviously a template, but it's a poor example nobody should follow. It isn't realistic or actionable. I have no idea what to do because I don't know what's going wrong. This is the type of map I see when a company really has its head in the sand. We suck, but people won't leave us and let's use some digital tools. 
Okay, for fun, there's one more, and then I've got a handful of slides, and we'll go to questions, and I will certainly stay late for questions, because I know we've had extra fun roasting these journey maps. So take a look at this one. This one, again, I found on Google Images, and it says it is an online shopping customer journey map, starting with motivation, searching for websites, browsing, evaluate, and paying. No persona. True. Not a good thing. Shopping for what? Yeah, I guess we don't really know. Anything. Doesn't matter. Needs? Who can say? <laughs> We've got 252 people here. Somebody must have... Why so happy? Yeah, there's lots of happy here. I like that they have customer expectations. Why is motivation on a comparable row with activities? I am so confused. Feeling won't magically go up after being very angry. Yeah, is box a feeling? Who? Simplistic and sentiment analysis, no decision fatigue? Who is the user? What are the problem areas? How does the person check ongoing deals? Very vague. I don't believe they're excited about having to find a gift. <laughs> Love it. Well, at least Box is happy. <laughs> what is Box is happy? Happy Box. Misleading infographic. What are the opportunities? Missing touch points. What is discount news? Yeah, these are great. I love, I love these. You've been a fantastic audience. Yes, there are more slides, but this is great. Pain points, anybody? No recognition of potential drop-off at the unhappy stages. It always assumes the person can be recovered. Yeah, like the last one. We magically uh, poop on this person at every step, but they're going to stay our customer. Only good thing is a discount. No Ferraris there. Seems like a funnel. Emotions are sim simplistic. It looks like a good customer journey map, but better description of the emotions. I'm not a big fan of the emotion stuff, I have to admit, because I, I there's only so much I can solve for that. I solve more for what people do and how they wish it went than how do they feel. I always think that for me, the feeling is the side effect of the process being awesome. Uh, I wonder if it's important to reflect variance in consumer experiences. I'll be talking about that coming up. So yeah, we still have a few more slides. So very little of this seems realistic to me. It seems made up and manipulated, which means it's risky and not a source of truth. We shouldn't make decisions based on a map like this. Nearly zero customers would say, I expect to find it easy to obtain news of discounts. This sounds like something marketing made up so they can say they're solving that by emailing the mailing list lots of discount offers. As a strategist, architect, and designer, I can't make a more user-friendly search engine until I learn what's wrong with our search or search results. So this doesn't help me design, and we would have to spin up a separate research project to know that. And how do we know that is the problem? We're going to show people ads and then allow them to hide ads, and the sales team selling the ads is going to allow that, and the advertisers are okay with that? Maybe we should just have fewer or no ads. If we make more money selling things to people than from ads, maybe we get rid of the ads and remove a whole step that makes people annoyed. Is the customer still happy with our website if they don't know how to find the best prices? Why is they can't find the best prices and they're kind of happy? Why? Why is this a happy moment? This says we need clear and innovative website design. Is our problem clarity? Is our problem a lack of website innovation? Innovation is creating something people have never seen before. What do we need to invent because people can't find the best price? Have our teams failed if they solve the price problem but don't innovate? I can go on and on with these, but I think you're all on the same page with me. So let's get to the last handful of slides. How do we make things more actionable? Remember, a lot of this is about the research that we've done. When we haven't done the research, our customer journey maps are likely to be inaccurate based on guesses, based on things we want to pretend people are doing, based on things that feed what we're hoping to get permission to do because we were going to do them anyway. And we have to remember customer journey map is about so much more than did we fill out a template with some things we think we know. 
an American government agency emailed me to ask about taking my customer centricity training. I sent them the web page describing the workshop and the key takeaways, and they replied they were not interested in that workshop because they just wanted to know how to make a customer journey map. What's on this screen and the entire qualitative CX and UX research process is how you make a customer journey map well. And some say assumption-based customer journey maps are good because you can learn what your team or stakeholders assume. That's a lot of time spent just to capture what one or more people guess or assume, and you run the risk that the document will be treated as accurate and truthful. There are other ways to capture assumptions like this exercise I have on the screen. It's a simple quadrant that you can run as a meeting, workshop, exercise, or something your teammates and stakeholders can do asynchronously. Your goal is to capture what they think they know about users, customers, this task, this journey, context, all of it. They can drop sticky notes where they have unanswered questions, guesses and assumptions, potentially outdated and incorrect information, and what they wish they knew. Yes, these are all variations of asking the same thing, but I find that when you ask them in different ways, it just sparks ideas from people and they add more notes than they otherwise would. Use this exercise to remind your team of the risk we have when we move forward with a project when we have so many unanswered questions. Use this to explain to people that we shouldn't be making customer journey maps, personas, or other documents without customer intelligence and accurate knowledge of all of the topics on this board. Then your qualified researchers can use this to create their research goals and plan one or more studies that answer all of these questions. Many customer journey maps don't account for variations in how people do things. I want to talk about task analysis, which I prefer over jobs to be done. Task analysis is normally done after qualitative research, like observing users and interviewing them. You can't do a great task analysis based on surveys or what we guess about people. Even diary studies can leave out steps or workarounds the user thinks wasn't important to mention. If we had had observed these people, we would have uh, noticed the missing puzzle pieces. Task analysis starts with a researcher creating a flow detailing every step the user takes based on what the researcher observed during the study. This is the what. What do they do? The researcher then adds notes related to the tools, knowledge, and workarounds the user employed to accomplish each step. This is the how of each step. They checked the sticky note at their desk. They asked a coworker where to find the right form. They went into photo editing software. We also add issues and concerns, anything that might be an obstacle or blocker of the process. Documenting tools, knowledge, workarounds, issues, concerns, and obstacles gives us six new categories where we can find behaviors, themes, preferences, unmet needs, insights, and opportunities. Sure, we want to improve the steps of the process, but we can also make improvements that account for all of these areas. Researchers then analyze the task flow and what we learned from our observations and interviews. Look for knowledge gaps, the difference between what we assumed people knew or understood and what they actually know or understand. Think about security. What do people know going into airport security versus what we assume they know? huge knowledge gap. And you'll see knowledge gaps in observational research, especially when people use workarounds, get stuck, or give up. Let me give you an example from some research my agency did in 2021. Our observational research asked people to shop for a certain item, pretending that they had $1,000 and needed to buy 125 of this same thing. Almost everybody grabbed a real calculator or their phone calculator and did 1,000 divided by 125 and said, okay, I have $8 per item. But then they were surprised at the end of the task when they were over budget. Only one person said, I don't have $8 per item. I probably have $6 per item because I know at the end of this, you're going to add setup fees and tax and shipping. She was right. Not only did we see the calculator used as a tool, but we saw the knowledge only one person had that shopping for this type of item had a lot of added costs at the end.
Now, going back to task analysis, after you're done with the analysis, then you make an optimized task flow, your desired future state, by looking at anywhere the system can take workload off the user. This isn't just automation and making the system perform steps of the task. It's also intelligently and deliberately architecting our systems to account for what we expect people to know or remember. Build knowledge into the system. And for that e-commerce uh, project, we added to their individual product page a way for people to enter their total budget. The system would then deduct taxes, shipping, setup, and other fees and tell you how many of this item you could afford. As you changed color, shipping speed, and other parameters, the number of items you could get for that budget changed. And I did all this in Axure. It was really fantastic. Uh, I'm very proud of it. Not only did this solve multiple problems and fix the tool and knowledge dependency, but we invented something no competitor was doing. During our generative research, we saw 20 competitors, and nobody had a way to enter your budget and see how many you could get. So you can start to see how a technique like this goes far beyond what we know from surveys and A-B tests. And if you want to learn more, we've got a bunch of free videos on the YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and write Delta CX Task Analysis, and you should get like four videos that we've done. And we're coming out with a book about it in about a month or two. Task dimensions is part of this. This is from Larry Marine. We can watch for these when researching with our current and target audiences to see where there are problems and potential opportunities. These end up in our task analysis. And by the way, we didn't invent this. Task analysis has been around for decades. Manually intensive. Does a task or flow have a lot of steps or manual work? High cognitive load. Don't make me think. People don't want to have to figure things out or make sense of your mess. Error prone. Is there a step where it's highly likely people will make a mistake whether or not they know it? It's not enough to give people an error message and hope they solve their own problem. Great CX keeps people from ever making that mistake in the first place. And knowledge dependent. Is there something we assumed a user knew, understood, or remembered that they don't? Think about when you've gone to pay a bill online and they ask for your account number. Now you have to dig up an old bill, find your account number. That was knowledge you didn't have. So that's an example of knowledge dependent. And I love task analysis diagrams because they really get into the variations of how different people might do things. So this is a little bit more of that flow chart approach that that earlier person mentioned. And I've got a lot of text describing this and I know we're running low on time. So very quickly, I did kind of the little piece of, the, of a possible journey. I made it up. Uh, what if we were waiting at a gate in an airport and suddenly they announced that they weren't going to be able to put everybody's bags in the overhead compartments? You're going to have to gate check your bag. So what's going to happen now? Well, people are going to do different things. Some people are going to gate check their bags. Some are going to repack their bags. Some are going to fight it. Some are going to consolidate their bags. But all of this takes different knowledge. Do I know what items to remove or or include. Um, if it's an e-cigarette, you have to keep it with you. You can't put it in the cargo hold. There's knowledge here that people don't know. And there's questions and blockers like, what am I doing and when do I get this back? So there's so many questions. And when we do an observational study and map it out this way, we can really clearly see it. Now, again, it's not focused on emotions. You could put a happy face on it if you want, but it's really focused on the parameters and details of the task. And that's where those of us who are critical thinkers and problem finders and solvers, it's just going to jump out at us what some of the possible improvements and solutions might be. And that's then where we swing back in and do our optimized task flow. Um, so, i uh, just got one more slide and then I'll take questions. Now, this is another style of map you could use. I'm playing with this. It might be a little bit much. I might have overdone it, but I'm playing with it as an idea. 
you're welcome to use some of it, none of it, all of it. Um, and um, I made this after I was having a really bad experience trying to get my car repaired. So this is obviously not a real project. This is just from my perspective. And I'm calling it an expanded service blueprint because it starts with the concept of a service blueprint, which uh, takes a journey map further. You start with the journey map, you add what's going on within the company and backstage technology and actors and actions and on stage stuff. And basically I've, I've just added a mountain of stuff to it just out of curiosity to see if it's going to help anything or anybody. So uh, I'm still experimenting with it. You can too. So we've got stages and sub stages and the amount of time they they'll take. We've got channels and evidence. We've got the customer steps and the onstage people, which are the workers they'll interact with. We've got onstage tools and technology with which customers will directly interact with. The backstage is people, tools, tech, and processes and other supporting processes. Um, from task analysis, from Larry Marine's task uh, stuff, I added questions, issues, blockers, tools, knowledge, workarounds, and these things from task dimensions, manually intensive, cognitive load, error prone, or knowledge dependent. I didn't fill these in. Maybe they won't always be relevant or work, but if you're observing some people having trouble getting their car repaired, you might see the customer's tools, workarounds, issues, and try putting them in. From customer journey maps, I put the customer's uh, likely thought or a real quote. Please don't use fake quotes. I left off the usual swim lane for emotions. I tend to not find those helpful or actionable. You can add that in if it's meaningful. I tend to be more focused on the experience, knowing that a better experience makes people happier. Um, I added opportunities and suggestions, but I didn't want these to be exact solutions, just possible direction for improvement, products, services, and experiences. UX Presha had icons for whether the process was straightforward or not, so I played with that. And I added some more swim lanes, metrics for what metric metrics do we have showing something's going right or wrong, or what metrics might we use later to measure this step of the process. I added risks, policies, and considerations. So is it a lot? Sure. Is it a more complete picture? Sure. You might want fantastic detail. You might want to uh, hide some of these swim lanes. It's just something I'm, I'm playing uh, with and you could uh, see what you think. And finally, last slide, I thought this was, sorry, last, last, last slide. Um, I uh, like to do, and I like to teach people to do what I call a customer disaster journey map. You can create this when you see risks in a project and negative outcomes, but others on your team just aren't seeing it. They imagine things will work out well. It'll go exactly as planned. Customers will remember tiny details and have no trouble with lots of steps of a process. I created this one some years ago when I was contracting at Macy's. The project I was on uh, sent people a beauty box. It was like little samples of makeup. And the idea was you would go back to the website and buy the big versions of the makeup if you liked the little ones. But the product manager and engineering didn't want to code the page so that when you clicked from the beauty box page to the real item, that it had the same color that we sent people. They wanted it to just show the default color, which for makeup would end up being a different color. And in this case, it was a lipstick. And I couldn't convince these people that it was worth it to code the page so that people coming from this page saw the product page with the color we actually sent them in the sample box. So I mapped it out. What would it look like? And this is a little bit more of a storyboard, but I like to call it the customer disaster journey map. What would it look like to order, uh, to get a sample lipstick, like it, order it, get a color you weren't expecting, talk to customer support who can't figure out why you're complaining about getting the color you ordered. They tell you to go to the store to fix it. Now you've got an errand to take care of. And then the customer ends up mad and, and angry and writing on social media and canceling their beauty box subscription because this sucked. And then when my teammates saw this, it hit them. The risk was unacceptable and they actually decided to uh, code the page uh, based on the suggestion I had. Now I'm using humor in this. If that works for your style and your team, you can use it too.
So with that, thank you for coming. Uh, you can check out my site at customercentricity.com. I've got some upcoming workshops at uh, cxcc.to slash space. My new book is Customers Know You Suck, Actionable CX Strategies to Better Understand, Attract, and Retain Customers. You can find it at cxcc.to slash ckys, including the uh, digital versions that are as little as a dollar on my website. Um, and if anybody wants coaching, I always give people free 30 minutes before charging them. So if you think I can help you, email me or let's just talk because uh, I want to try to help people. Um, so hopefully we've got some questions. I'll stop sharing my screen. And I haven't been following the chat, so. It's okay. Help me. What are the questions? Okay. First of all, thank you so much, Debbie, for, for this talk, for this engaging talk. That was a lot of fun, actually, with the, the, uh, the poll stuff. Uh, and I really like the, the activity of the people. Um, uh, we will actually go ahead and take some time for questions. Unfortunately, we will need like another 10 or 15 minutes probably for that. So if someone needs to go, well, we understand that. If you have questions and you want to need, and you really want to hear an answer, so please stay with us for another 10, 15 minutes. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I would like, to, uh, please, if you have questions, be sure to type them in the chat. And meanwhile, I would like to remind that you can visualize customer journeys, analyze and improve your customer's experience, and do that all with your teammates in Uxpressure platform. Register and start exploring the features on your own or sign up for a personal demo and our team will highlight the features that you might be interested in. And if you want to speed up your journey mapping process and if you are looking for some good templates, do check the ones that we have at Uxpressure. So now let's move to the questions that you have. And we actually had a couple of questions during your talk. The first one was from Elena. Uh, that was when you were talking about the criteria. Um, what about the future state map for a journey that doesn't exist now? What do you think about that? A future state map for a journey that doesn't exist now. So if the journey doesn't exist, and it sounds like this is a, a product that doesn't exist, and I mean, well, technically the journey exists. We might not have a product for it. And if we do the observational research around it, we'll see what people are doing now. There's got to be a journey for this. It just might not include our company, or we might not have built a product or service that addresses it. But there is a journey. There's something that humans are doing now, unless this is so new and so innovative that no humans are doing anything like this or related to this, which probably exists, but it is probably rare. And I wish we had more uh, context from that person. But, um, oh, wait, is yes, this we like have. Uh, on, on oh, yes. onboarding for a new product? Yeah, I'm always amazed how focused people are on onboarding and sometimes not as focused on the rest of the product. But um, onboarding is, is certainly a journey, but the question is, how is there a way that people are doing this now and what have we learned from that? And when it comes to onboarding, my general advice for onboarding is separate from customer journey map advice. It's give people the least onboarding they have to because they want to use whatever this is. They want to do it, they want to use it. And I find a lot of times people think more onboarding, more tutorials, more tips, more or first time experiences. The least onboarding is the best onboarding because ultimately you all, if it's something where you need to collect information or link a bank account or whatever, okay, you have to do that. But I find some people, you end up with, oh, well, marketing wants us to collect this information and we want to show them this video. If you're product is intuitive, easy to learn and easy to use. You don't need all that stuff. Your onboarding can be minimal. Take out your swipey tutorials, take out your tool tips, take out your pop-up stuff and walkthroughs. Just make an intuitive, easy product. That's all you need. You don't have to customer journey map the onboarding. Chances are, and I don't know what you're building or what industry you're in. It's B2B and tech stuff, so it's very complicated, but it doesn't have to be complicated. So the question is, what is the least onboarding that you can do so people can get started? I look at complicated tech systems like AHA, uh, hashtag not sponsored. I'm definitely not paying them. I'm paying monday.com. But you look at AHA 
And there isn't a lot that you have to put into AHA to get started. So the question to Elena and her coworkers would be, what is the least information we need to collect from people so they can just get into this thing and feel like they're they're using it? So be careful of overcomplicating the onboarding stuff. Only ask people for the deal breakers, like, wow, they're really not going to make it very far in our system if we don't make sure we have this piece of information or whatever it is. Now is not the time to walk them through everything this thing does and try to take them to school. It, this is not, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even go there. Agree, thank you. Yeah, feel free to write to me privately if you think I can help more than that. But but I think the minimal onboarding is the best onboarding. And I would I would say your usability testing can hopefully support that. Thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, we have another question from Becky. So how can you use multiple journey maps so that some zoom in on more details of one portion of your higher level one? Yeah, so for me, I'm usually doing task analysis more than I'm doing customer journey maps, just because I find them to be more detailed and more actionable. And in that case, we typically have uh, something that might be more high level, and then we're breaking it down into its subtasks. But again, you have to be really knowledgeable of what that journey is to break it down into subtasks. Otherwise, we might be guessing. So even when we think about the airport experience, there's so many subtasks there, it hurts you know you're going to need 40 customer journey maps but hypothetically if you really were trying to look at the end-to-end -end airport experience then you need a squillion journey maps maybe you need to take a look at what it, what are you focused on right now and start with the trigger for that particular thing and then look at that particular journey um because again sometimes i mean we want to be end to end but if you are looking at improving going through airport security we have to take a look at what that includes ultimately that does include a lot of things and i think it does start with packing for the trip but already right there you have a knowledge dependency and a knowledge gap so the best thing i can uh suggest is um we do make multiple task analyses for different tasks and then we show on kind of a larger flow chart how these tasks are are related to each other and sometimes that's part of the optimization process because even how the tasks relate to each other or the order they should go in or something like that is uh is something that could be improved so i know that was a bit of a general answer but but hopefully a little bit helpful thank you so much once again debbie and we have a question from leah what are some questions you ask in qualitative interviews to help you create better journey maps and hit all necessary pain points show me how you do this really yeah, so basically, it, our, a lot of our qualitative observational research at my company is observational. Sometimes there's something that happens over such a long period of time that it's hard to watch and we have to uh, kind of incorporate other methods like a diary study or interviews or partial observations. But if it's something that, that you can watch in kind of one sitting, hypothetically, you could go to the airport and follow someone with their permission and watch them go through the whole airport and security process. You could do that in, in one sitting, but I'm not going to interrupt them. I'm not going to ask them a lot of things. So I would say don't make the mistake of thinking that the qualitative process is about asking people, hey, tell me about the time you did this. That's plan B. Plan A is can you go watch this? Can you go watch people do whatever this is in their natural environment or some piece of this? Maybe if it's about buying cars, maybe you're spending some time in car dealerships with permission, listening to some of the conversations that salespeople have with prospective buyers. That's part of the journey is being in the car dealership for that time. So ultimately, the best, question, the best questions are, show me how you do this and how could this be improved? That's it. We, I don't ask, did you like it? Will your cousin like it? Would you pay for it? It's really just, I want to understand what the journey and the task are, and mostly I want to watch it. If I can't watch it, I'll ask more about it. And if it's something over time and we have time, then a diary study might be part, uh, one of the multiple methods we use. Thank you so much. 
And we have a question from Tiziana. You mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned that you don't use emotion as much because a good experience makes people happy. However, shouldn't emotion include it when you analyze uh, the different journeys? For example, if you are in a bad mood because you have been body checked by TSA, this will be influenced, this will influence how you feel the rest of the journey. Yeah, hypothetically, I think for uh, it real that's going to be person to person. Some people are going to hold on to that for the rest of the day, and some people <laughs> are going to let it go fast. We don't know. I'm still angry about going through sec a a security in Manchester, UK airport in 2019. So I'm really holding on to that a long time. That still gets a sad face and and angry fire. Don't don't go through the Manchester airport. But um, I think that. What I, what I always say about this is if adding emotion to a journey map or service blueprint helps you or your team in any way, then go ahead and put that on there. I just find that sometimes it takes up a lot of room and it's, it's a pretty picture that people look at, but I'm not sure that it necessarily sparks action. I can still document that experience. I can say, you know, Anna then goes to the food court She's still pissed about the security experience and, and she buys too much Panda Express and really overdoes it, uh, you know, or um, Anna hated her security experience so much she drops by C's Candies and overspends on Scotch Mallows. So I think that, you know, this, it can be part of your storytelling or it can be part of the visual journey mapping. I think we're used to putting emotions on there, but I personally tend to find that, that people sometimes get distracted by the emotions. Emotions, happy face, sad face, uh, high line, low line. And I really want people to, to be more familiar with the real process and experience. So again, put emotions on there. If it helps you and your team and your project, um, I tend to not put them on there, but that's just a personal choice. I think it can, it can go either way. Thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, and thank you from Tiziana. <laughs> See you soon. Uh, uh, we have another question from Leah. Uh, is the collaboration template for research planning done before conducting the actual research, during or after? Uh, great question. Thanks. Yeah, as I like to say about that uh, quadrant with the collaboration, um, I would love to see this done at the start of every project when you're planning the project, because maybe it changes how you plan a project. Maybe we, we try to start a project or we do super early planning of a project. We do this exercise, which could take half hour maybe less if you can get everybody together it doesn't have to be a multi-day workshop this is this is a 20 minute exercise in my opinion um get everything up there look at that and say okay we have a lot of unanswered questions can we make time in this project for one or more research methods whatever they might be to help us answer these questions and that way because that might change the project planning but in my opinion there is never a bad time to do that quadrant exercise i did a talk a couple of days ago for a private company and they do a lot of cro and ab testing and they were like can we can we do that quadrant if an A-B test fails and we don't know why? And I said, why not? There's never a bad time for people to sit down, even for 15 or 20 minutes and say, what did we think we knew? What were our guesses and assumptions? What do we wish we know? what's going on here? So I think while mm -hmm. I love to do these at the start and I'm now sending them to my clients as soon as they sign my contract, I think there's never a bad time to run that exercise and figure out what, what do we think we know? What are we guessing and assuming? What do we wish we knew? And then ask ourselves, can we make the time and invest in answering the unanswered questions? Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question. It's from Caitlin. Should we always make journey maps based on research and avoid assumption-based maps? Yeah, that is just my personal opinion. Like I said earlier, there are some people who love assumption-based maps uh, because they think, well, it's fast. Let's just get assumptions out there. There are defi There's definitely a group of people who seem to think that working from guesses and assumptions are faster. But I would ask people to calculate the real costs of their projects and the problems and failures and, and customer issues that it, it creates. And 
put that into the cost of your project and put the cost of fixing it later into your project and then make sure that guesses and assumptions really are cheaper and faster because my hypothesis would be they're not so um that that that's where i stand on that i am not for i feel like in the time that i took to make an assumption based map do research and then fix the map and hope that people aren't too in love with the map that I've now torn up and thrown away and said, wait a minute, this didn't turn out to be true. I could just run the quadrant exercise. The quadrant exercise will capture those assumptions and guesses. I don't have to make a fake customer journey map out of it. And then I can just make a much better one. It might even help us reframe our problems. So. It, uh, someone saying, I think it would be good to make an assumption-based map, do a research-based map, and talk through the comparison of why. Yeah, I mean, Brian's not wrong. You certainly, if you want to wake people up to the danger of their assumptions and guesses, Brian's right. You could start with an assumption-based map uh, with guesses and assumptions, and we know our customers. And then you could do your quadrant do the research that answers all the questions in the quadrant. Yes, that might take four or six weeks to do really good observational and qual research, and then come back and go, hey, turns out this is the actual customer journey. And then say, hey, here's an example of what happens when, you know, here, let's think about the risk that we could have, you know, do a future perspective. What would, what would have been the risk if we had run with this as a source of truth rather than what ended up being the truth. So I, I would agree with Brian there, though. Again, do just do that once and, and you know, hopefully then it tells the story. And how does the quadrant map capture assumptions? Yeah, so the quadrant, uh, and you can reword it if it would help you, but the quadrant has four areas. It's um, guesses and assumptions. So that's literally on, on the map right there. Guesses and assumptions, and this could be about users, the task, the process, the journey, uh, the context, anything related to this project or area of product. Guesses and assumptions, what I wish I knew, potentially outdated or incorrect information like oh we studied people five years ago ah, it's a different world now um and oh gosh i'm forgetting the fourth i have to go look at my own slide is it bedtime yet hold on oh unanswered questions yeah so basically um these basically say the same things four ways. And if you want to word them differently, you can. You could put a fifth one that says, what I think I know. But that can accidentally sound a little bit judgmental. But that's really what you're trying to collect. What do people think they know about any of this? About people, contexts, and systems. Whatever it is. The journey. The task. However you want to look at it. So um, are they open-ended questions? They might be. I've had people put stuff on, on these ranging from very specific questions that they want to know about human behavior to really broad questions that my research probably isn't going to answer, like how much will people pay for this when it's when this represents something we haven't even imagined or built yet? How much will people pay for a thing we don't even know what it is? Okay, that's out of scope. So yeah, you do get lots of questions, but to me, I love that because it helps us as researchers start to create our research plan and goals, decide our methods, figure out our recruiting, who do we want to meet and how many of them. So I love collecting everybody's unanswered and open questions about whatever this is. And I'll have to tell them some of them are out of scope or kind of unreasonable, and many of them I can answer. Thank you once again. And I believe we have time for like two questions. Uh, so the first one will be from Elena. Uh, if we think about it enough, we can always create a CGM with more complexity and represent more diverse experiences. How do we know when the complexity is becoming too much and not useful or actionable? And that's going to be the eye of the beholder. You know, you've got a B2B universe. Oh, oh this might be a different Elena. Um, yes. So I don't know what universe you have other Elena, but ultimately um, I would say usually the problem isn't um, 
too much complexity, I think usually our customer journey maps are lacking information or lacking depth or possibly lacking the true complexity of the true journey. So I'm not worried about putting in too much. Um, and that's another reason where you could use uh, one of these types of tools. And again, uh, not sponsored, you know, there's certainly UX Presha and there's others, but um, you can use a tool where you can put more complexity into your service blueprint or some of your other stuff and then just hide that swim lane for certain audiences. Just because you have information in a map doesn't mean every audience sees the same map. You can certainly try to, to condense or hide some of that. But ultimately, I would say we do want more diverse experiences. Um, the project we're doing, uh, a project we've done at my company, uh, they first had some market research and market research went and talked to eight millennials in New York City making about $100,000 a year. That was extremely uh, vanilla. They, they, they didn't get a lot of good information out of that. And we do want there to be diversity. We do want to meet people who have ADHD, are autistic, have other conditions. And so I think that too often our, our customer journey map it didn't even look at all of these people. They're not edge cases. They're real people. Stop treating them like edge cases. The, these, are, these are real humans with real needs and they're 25 5% of the population. They're not some weird edge case. This is the middle of the bell curve. Most of us right now have some sort of, of disability condition or diagnosis that affects how we move through life. So stop acting like Anna just sails through an airport, you know, on, on wings and roller skates because she's got, she, we've, we all have stuff. We have more baggage than the suitcases we packed. Thank you so much. And the last question for today. So uh, we were we talked about like a lot of here. Uh, customer journey maps are handy, but Peter is asking, when would you not use a CGM? Are there moments when it would be the entire run next step? Yeah, I have to say, I don't use them much because I've fallen in love with task analysis. You know, I thought customer journey maps were cool, and then I discovered task analysis. I also find people think jobs to be done is cool, and then they discover task analysis. So, you know, to me, task analysis is really a great way to go, and it goes beyond the customer journey map. Also, service blueprinting goes beyond the customer journey map. So to me, I'm not using customer journey maps because there's something in inherently wrong with a customer journey map, I'm using them less because I feel like I've kind of evolved, that they worked for me for at one point, but then wait a minute, there's, I want more information here. There's more I'm trying to solve for than, than what I can put into this Nielsen Norman group template or whatever I found. So, um, oh, uh, thank, and thank you to the private message I'm getting. Yes, absolutely valued. Um, so sorry, that was, a, a, uh, sorry, it was a private message. I don't know how to answer that. It's private. Um, so uh, if a customer journey, you, you always have to pick the right tool for the job. There are some people who use Figma for everything, and I'm over here going, okay, Figma's great sometimes, but you should really know Axure because when you want to test your prototype, Figma's not a realistic prototype. It looks good, but it's a click-through model. You need Axure for more realistic prototyping. And some people go, now nah, I'm going to keep using Figma. And some people go, hey, what's this Axure thing? So it's just a matter of picking the right tool for the job. Sometimes a customer journey map can be a good match to what's going on at your company and, and what the project needs. And sometimes you might say, let's try one of these other uh, possible art. These are all artifacts. They're just documents. And when you have done your research and you have your information and you say, okay, now how do we map and document this? Then you have to figure out what matches it. The, the project we're working on now, we originally promised our client a task analysis. And then when we finally interviewed people, we found nobody did anything remotely the same way at all. And then we realized we weren't even uh, having them, we weren't even talking to them about the same tasks. It was such a broad target audience. They're not even doing the same thing. I can't make a task analysis. I have to make a different artifact that matches what the study kind of accidentally ended up being and what's going to best 
help that client and deliver the answers and information that will help them create strategies, decisions, and initiatives that benefit the business and the customers and users. Thank else. you. Thank you so much. Uh, as far as I can see from Peter's uh, reply in the chat, it helps. <laughs> cool. If you want to see more events like this, make sure to check the upcoming ones at expression.eventbrite.com or check the recordings we've got on this channel. Take care and I will see you around.